My friends, I speak to you in, in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, many of us may be familiar with parables, and hearing Jesus share them often. Parables can be a very dangerous thing to interpret. More often than not, we're led to what seems to be the most obvious point in the story. But for those of us who are not from the culture of the day, major details get lost upon us. The parable of the prodigal son is one such parable, in which it's easy for us to miss the actual deeper meaning of the story. Indeed, it is a story of God's everlasting love and God's generous forgiveness of us. But it's more than that. This gospel resonates deeply in the Lenten season. A little word about the culture of the day. And it's still very much a part of the culture of the Middle East today and many other places around the world in which we call it, in, in a sense, an honor-shame culture. In that day and age, there were very strict rules about how one related to one's elders or with each other. In an honor-shame culture, children must do everything they can to earn the pride of their parents. And if they fail in that task, it often brings great shame to the family. Now this story heightens this reality in the sense that the son goes to his father even before he's dead and says, I want my inheritance from you. At that day and time, such a request would have been essentially saying to his father, you are dead to me. I want nothing with you. It would have been such a shameful act that it must have broken the father's heart to have his son reject him in such a way. But things get even worse. The son squanders all he has and then violates every religious rule of the day in enslaving himself to feed pigs. Now many of you know, pigs were considered unclean. So the son has essentially made himself unclean. He's now a non-person himself. And he has a choice. Do I remain here or do I go home? It was not an easy decision for him. He had brought extraordinary shame to his family and likely if he would return home by the culture of that day, he would be a non-person to the people, even to his own father. His father likely in the traditional norms would not even acknowledge him as his son. He may take him into the house, but not acknowledge him fully for who he is. The son decides to take the risk. Now fathers at the time, being a very patriarchal society, would never grovel to their children. Sure, they would show affection and they would show care. But there was always a demand that the children show deference and obedience to the father. But the father in Jesus' story does something so radically profound that it actually misses us in our culture. Even before the son comes to the house, the father sees him in the distance and he runs to him. No father in that time would run to his son even a son in good standing, let alone a son who has basically said only maybe weeks or months earlier, you're dead to me. But the father goes to him. He runs out to him. And before the son can even give his prepared speech, his prepared apology, 
The father embraces him, he loves him, he holds him in his arms and kisses him. Now to Jesus' audience, this would have been scandalous. They would have been sitting there thinking, hadn't that same son just considered you dead? But now you're breaking every rule and you're going to go love him, and not only love him, but lavishly love him? To make it worse for them, the father puts on an extraordinary feast. The crowd in Jesus' day would have certainly identified with the other son, who rightly says to his father, I've served you all these years. I followed every rule in the book. And you've given me nothing. But my brother, who has completely disobeyed you, completely ignored you, you give a feast? This whole story contradicts every, or breaks every rule of society of that day. Now often, when we look at the story, we believe Jesus is speaking of the Father in a way that reveals God. And if we follow that line, this story says something incredibly profound about our God. And it also says something about us. God does not simply forgive and love you. God does more than that. God actually races out and tries to find you because God loves you totally and completely. Now I know you may have heard that a number of times, but let me say that again. God loves you so much that God is constantly in search of you, calling you to God's self. And God is doing whatever God can to invite you into this deep relationship with him. And that this God of ours does not judge us as society judges us, but loves us by virtue of us being good. We have been formed and fashioned in God's image, and God loves you every bit of who you are, no matter what you have done. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. And there is nothing you need to do to earn that love. See, this is the problem with the other son. The other son thought that in order to win his father's love, he had to do something. Father, I slaved for you all these years. Why aren't you giving me this? And the father says, I loved you anyways. You didn't need to do that. There's nothing you need to do to earn the father's love. All you need to do is to let yourself be embraced, to come, to set yourself before the God who created you, the God who loves you, the God who breathes life into your mortal bodies. That's all you have to do. In God's eyes, you are good. In God's eyes, you are beloved. And in God's eyes, you're beautiful. So much so that God will step down from God's pride and reach out and embrace you as he does with his son. Now, a moment ago, I said that this parable also says something about us. And it's striking how those who put the lectionary together, the setting of readings that we have for each Sunday, they pair this reading with St. Paul's famous passage in which he says, you and I are to be ambassadors of Christ. 
And what St. Paul is getting at there is you and I must live as Christ has lived for us. We are not simply just to love people. We're actually to go out there and actually embrace them and love them. To go beyond the very basics of society. To love people for who they are. And not to judge them based upon what they've done or who they are. We are to love people by virtue of them as persons, beloved and beautiful in the sight of God. Ollie said this so well last week, that the mission of the church is for us to come together at this table and to experience that radical love of God, that God who says, come, come, journey with me, come to the table, feast with me, share in this relationship with me. And now that you've been fulfilled and satisfied, go out into that world and be me in this world. Love others as I have loved you. Not just being nice, not just doing the things we have to do, but really love others. Go to the place of pain and suffering. Go to the place where people are alone and isolated and love as God has loved us. We are to run to others as God runs to the Son. That's the point of this parable. Today we celebrate Letare Sunday. It's a Sunday in the church's year where we, in some places they wear rose vestments. It's a Sunday in the year where we start to see the glimmer of hope. The Easter light is beginning to shine. Sure, I know it's snowed out there. <laughs> May not feel like it this morning. But you'll notice the little green leaves sprouting from the ground. New life is coming. And that's the point of the story, too. Sin and death are powerless before God. God is about life, and so shall we. But if we're to understand that, and if we are to embody, if we are to be ambassadors of the love of God, then we must first learn to love. We must first gather. This is why in the church's life, Sunday Eucharist is absolutely essential. If you want to learn love, you got to come to the table. We don't come here to act. We don't come here to simply do something that we feel we must do. We come here because the living God invites us invites us into relationship with each other and to gather around that holy table and say, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body. Through word and sacrament, we are formed and shaped into the very likeness of God. And we are compelled, as Ali said last week, to go out and to be God in the world. So, my friends, will you come to the table of love? Will you come simply as you are, beloved, beautiful, and good in the eyes of God, and let yourselves be surrounded by the Father's love? Then come to the table and feast. And not only that, but invite others. This is an extraordinary thing that we're about to do here. Welcome others to the table. Run out into the world and invite them to share in the table of life. Amen.